Good. All right. So uh, firstly, thanks so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, my name is Adam Kaufman from Jilla in Boulder. Um, uh, and yeah, with that, let me begin. Um, so uh, uh, let me just say first that this is the work that I'll be describing here is uh, uh, from my group and also from a large team at Jilla. So uh, primarily, I'll be talking about work coming out of my strontium tweezer uh, experiment, which uh, is led by a postdoc, Nathan Shine, PhD students Aaron Young and Will Eckner, <clears throat> as well as a previous postdoc, uh, Matt Norsha, who's now actually at Innsbruck. Uh, I have another experiment in my lab that which I won't have much time to talk about. Um, and finally, um, I want to highlight that this the strontium work, uh, specifically in the context of clocks that I'll be describing, uh, really has emerged out of a collaboration with the Yi group, uh, both in terms of really learning a lot about clocks from them, as well as uh, being able to uh, understand our system better using um, a state-of-the-art 10 millihertz wide laser. Okay, so this is a, 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 a quantum science uh, meetup is I think the technical term that I heard. Um, so, you know, to start here, let's just think about what are, uh, what would we want for an ideal quantum device or machine um, in a broad sense. So, you know, this could be for metrology, quantum computing, or quantum simulation. Um, so this might include having uh, many identical quantum objects that we might call qubits. Uh, We'd want these qubits to be able to store quantum information, that is quantum coherence, for long periods of time. Uh, we'd like to be able to prepare these qubits in deterministic initial states. Um, we'd like to be able to uh, individually read out and control these atoms. Uh, and finally, um, as has been a theme in these talks so far, we'd like to implement strong controllable interactions between these qubits so that uh, uh, we can really explore the full Hilbert space available to these systems. So um, again, as we've heard, uh, there are many different ways uh, being uh, explored for actually achieving this wish list, uh, ranging from uh, trapped ions, ultra cold atoms, as we heard from Emmanuel, um, Rydberger ways, as we heard from Antoine, as well as other things in the solid state like superconducting qubits and NV centers. Um, and what I'll be describing today will really continue on this theme of atoms and tweezer arrays. Uh, and if you missed any uh, of Antoine's talk, let me just remind you, and this is all you'll really need to know, uh, optical tweezer arrays, this technology, the basic idea is I take some light, I shine it into a microscope objective over here. Um, uh, this objective makes a tight focus of light at which I can trap individual single atoms uh, from a cloud initially of, of pre-cooled, like a, a pre-cooled laser cooled cloud. Um, this same objective I can use to collect fluorescence from the atoms and make images such as these in the center. Let me just confirm you can see my mouse, yes? Yes, we can. Good, okay. Um, and so these are images, this is an averaged image of single atoms in our tweezer arrays. And as Antoine said, this is really building off pioneering work from the Grangier group in 2001. Okay, so uh, uh, these systems uh, combine a suite of extremely powerful capabilities for quantum science, including being able to make tunable, uh, defect-free uh, arrays and really nearly arbitrary geometries as you know, we saw you know, paintings. Uh, <laughs> the single particle readout can be used to look at correlation functions in a single shot manner. Um, the fact, and this alludes to one of the questions actually that came in during Antoine's talk, the fact that these systems can actually operate at fairly high speed compared to typical ultra-cold atom experiments means that we can actually uh, uh, accrue information from them very quickly to get, gain precision quickly. So for instance, here on the right, I'm showing you uh, a correlation function that's quite small in absolute magnitude, but can be measured quite precisely nevertheless. Uh, finally, um, in addition to the Rydberg interactions that we've already heard, these tweezer systems can be used to engineer all uh, uh, other kinds of interactions, including collisional interactions, where you say take two individual atoms and overlap them so that they can collide. Um, or uh, as, been, as has been recently pursued, uh, uh, trapping molecules in twe tweezers where you can have dipole-dipole interactions from uh, the fact that the atoms are molecules or the particles are molecules. Okay, so this, this, this suite of capabilities has really led to uh, a large amount of progress in recent years, including in quantum information processing, where um, in tweezer arrays, people have demonstrated single qubit gates uh, above 99% fidelity. Bell state fidelities and long lived type refined qubits can be uh, at the 95% level. Um, and as we've heard, uh, these systems can be used for many body physics using uh, long range spin interactions, long range Rydberg interactions rather to engineer spin models, as well as to look at things like uh, um, uh, really um, deterministic, well defined Hubbard systems. And so, in terms of the exact science that's been pursued, this has really been run the gamut from 
few body Hubbard physics to transverse Ising models to non equilibrium spin dynamics and Kibble Zurich physics, the topological phenomena like we just heard. It's really uh, an amazing amount of work. Okay, so uh, 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 recently, um, one direction of interest has been really to try to expand. Uh, uh, the scope of particles that might be trapped in tweezers in hopes that maybe something more complex might afford uh, uh, new applications for these systems. Um, <clears throat> so far, a lot of the work is focused on trapping alkali atoms, which are atoms that have a single electron in their valence shell, which makes them a lot easier to control. So uh, this effort has include, included things like trapping molecules in tweezers, like I was just alluding to a moment ago, um, and trapping atoms like alkaline earth atoms in tweezers. Now, alkaline earth atoms are special because in their valence shell, they have two electrons rather than one. Uh, and in a moment, I'll tell you that that additional electron actually opens up a huge number of different directions. Um, and let me point out as well that in addition to the work going on at Chile and my group, this is being pursued by a number of different uh, uh, universities and entities, including uh, in the Andres group at Caltech and the Thompson group at Princeton uh, and at Atom Commuting, as we'll hear from Brian later. And actually, there are a number of groups uh, on the way, which is sort of very exciting and you know it's a little terrifying too. All right, so let's uh, keep going here. So why, why would we want to pursue alkaline earth atoms and tweezers? Well, so it turns out that by virtue of having this additional electron, the transition structure of these systems is a bit more complicated in a way that's very useful for quantum science. So for instance, this broad transition that I'm showing here that I call the imaging transition, it can work in tandem with this narrow line cooling transition uh, to do high fidelity, high resolution imaging of single atoms. Um, this narrow transition can also be used for doing high fidelity ground state cooling, that is uh, taking a single atom and cooling it to the quantum mechanical ground state of the optical tweezer. Um, and alkaline earth atoms in general uh, have been famous for their use in metrology, namely because of this transition between the singlet S0 ground state and the P0 excited state, which is a long-lived optical transition whose intrinsic quality factor, when you view this transition as an oscillator, is 10 to the 17, which is, you can't find that you know, uh, in the solid state. This is really a, an amazing property of these atoms uh, and has fueled a huge amount of progress in optical frequency metrology and clocks. Uh, finally, um, another nice feature of alkaline earth atoms is that they have um, in their fermionic isotopes um, a nuclear spin that can be really nicely controlled for quantum information and also can work in tandem with this clock transition for new kinds of readout architectures. Okay, so um, uh, beginning with uh, the work in 2018 where uh, the three groups that I was uh, mentioning earlier demonstrated trapping of alkaline earth atoms, including strontium and ytterbium, uh, there have been a number of different results. So including uh, uh, demonstrating how this system can be used for a new clock architecture and finally, how these systems can be uh, uh, used for Rydberg physics as well. Um, so I'm really going to be focusing here on this, this, uh, this middle block, looking at a so-called tweezer clock. So um, to really understand why we're doing this, why, why make a tweezer clock, I wanted to give a, an overview of you know, what is an atomic clock and why, why might it uh, benefit from tweezer technology. So an atomic clock, um, like any clock, relies on the regular uh, periodic motion of some oscillator, uh, whose regular motion we can count and use to uh, track the passage of time. So in the atomic clock case, um, this, these oscillations are given by, uh, uh, are defined by a transition in the atom. And you can think of this uh, semi-classically as uh, if I put the atoms in a superposition of these two states, the electron wave packet is jiggling back and forth at an extremely high frequency, namely the splitting of this transition. So this could be microwave or optical. Uh, or you can think of it as the evolution of the atomic coherence uh, at the energy difference between the, the ground and the excited state. And so at any given time, that might have some phase factor phi. Uh, and importantly, the lifetime of this superposition upper bounds the quality factor of this oscillator. That is, how many times it can oscillate before it decays. And that's a really important property of clocks. Um, in general, this, this basic paradigm of keeping track of time with atoms uh, has been tremendously successful over the past, uh, now actually 60 years, beginning with work using microwave clocks like uh, uh, with cesium atoms, um, and also more recently using optical clocks where the transition is no longer in the microwave but is in the optical domain. Uh, and amazingly, in recent years, these systems can perform some of the most precise measurements ever done by humankind, including uh, having accuracy at the part in 10 to the 18 to the 10 to 19 level, 
uh, in ion, trapped ions and neutral atoms, as well as precisions that can be uh, uh, accrued in just an hour at the five times 10 to the minus 19 level. So this could be used for things like study of gravitational redshifts over truly absurdly small length scales, like a centimeter, studies of geodesy, can be used for navigation and timekeeping. It could redefine the second, uh, which presently is defined by uh, microwave clocks. Uh, and finally, it can be used for things like studying the, the time variation of fundamental constants. Okay, so one thing I wanted to explain, because it's important to this talk, is, is to sort of highlight why, why is there this difference in the performance of time of optical clocks versus microwave clocks. And furthermore, you can see that in recent years, the optical clocks have really started to gain a lot in their precision compared to microwave clocks. Um, so to understand this, let me first just describe how in practice an atomic clock would work. So we'd have some local oscillator. This could be a laser, it could be a microwave synthesizer. In this case, I'm gonna show you a laser. Uh, and this laser might be stabilized to a reference cavity, which takes care of a lot of noise over a large bandwidth. But this cavity, since it's in the solid state, is susceptible to all sorts of environmental effects that might cause its length to slowly change with time, and consequently for its resonant frequency to change, which is what's referencing the laser frequency. So the atoms come in by providing an absolute uh, uh, frequency reference against such perturbations. Um, the stability, that is the precision uh, accrued as a function of time, uh, averaging time, tau say, of this system depends on the Q of the oscillator, that is the bigger the Q, the better the precision you can get as a function of time, uh, as well as the number of atoms, and that's because of quantum projection noise in the systems. I take a single shot, all of these atoms are just like flipping a coin, and I'm always gonna have some projection noise associated with that. And that gives you the square root end scaling that you'd expect. Um, another effect known as the Dick effect, I'm not gonna say too much about this, is actually a very important part of these systems. And it's the fact that uh, one, it's, di it's very difficult to continuously probe these atoms. I have to prepare them and detect them and then prepare them again and do an interrogation, which means I have dead time in my experiment, which aliases down noise, high frequency noise on my laser into the time domain of the experiment. And the upshot of this is that the stability that you might expect given the atom number and Q that you have in your system intrinsically can't necessarily be achieved given the laser noise that you have in your experiment and the duty cycle that you might have. So if you can improve your duty cycle more and more, that is reduce the amount of time that you spend doing other things besides interrogating your atoms, you can really imp improve the performance of your clock. So then overall, the wish list for this kind of system I'd say is to have many atoms, have long coherence time because having a longer coherence time effectively improves the quality factor of the oscillator that you're, you're probing, uh, and finally to operate with high duty cycle. So, uh, let's, let's now square that with the leading platforms for optical atomic clocks. So one is the uh, trapped ion clocks, uh, of which there are some amazing ones in Israel, uh, where a single or a few atoms uh, are, are sort of uh, ions rather, behave as really ideal quantum sensors and they can be uh, interrogated at high duty cycle. Uh, the challenge with this system is that because you only have a few ions, the quantum projection noise, that is this one over root n scaling from here, um, makes things hard to average down quickly. Oh, whoops. Um, on the other hand, we have optical lattice clocks where many, many atoms can be tra trapped in a standing wave of light, similar to what uh, Emmanuel was talking about. Um, so you can have thousands of optically trapped atoms, which improves your quantum projection noise. However, one needs to be careful about things like interactions between the atoms, which can decohere or shift the clock transition systematically. The atoms might tunnel. Uh, and furthermore, duty cycle can be more of a consideration for these experiments. Okay, so now let's think about why alkaline earth atoms and tweezers might be a compelling alternative uh, technology for atomic clocks. So first of all, um, uh, in these systems, we can make um, uh, many traps. Here I'm showing you 10 traps, of which on average, there are five filled. Uh, this is an average image, but as uh, Antoine showed us, you can make many more, and I'll also show you later in the talk. Um, these atoms can be loaded on a 100 millisecond time scale in our experiment. Um, furthermore, these atoms can be imaged uh, losslessly and at high fidelity so that once we load them, we can reuse them many, many times. Um, finally, uh, the atoms can be ground state cooled. I'm, I'm not gonna say too much about what this spectrum is. Uh, I think uh, many of the, um, the experts in the audience will recognize this as a sideband spectrum. What it tells you is that the, the temperature of these atoms when laser cooled on this special transition that I was talking about can be well close to the ground state where less than 10% of the atoms at any given time are excited beyond the ground state. Um, and by virtue of having these ground state atoms, we can really probe the clock transition for a long time because the coherence time is extended. 
So then altogether, what this means is that I have many atoms, they can be probed at long coherence time, and I have high duty cycle. That is to say, the dead time in these experiments is quite low. Um, sorry, my mouse is having issues. So uh, with that, this means that this, is, this assembly of capabilities really puts the tweezer clock as a, as a compromise between trapped ion clocks and optical lattice clocks, in the sense that we could have uh, more atoms than ions approaching what might be a, a rise in lattice clocks, but at the same time probe them uh, um, uh, at long interrogation times in a high duty cycle. So um, uh, in our first work on this topic in 2019, we were able to show second scale coherence in these systems, that is actually the three second scale, uh, really by exploring this system using this silicon crystal cavity laser. And one of the things that uh, we learned is that really having cold atoms was critical to being able to have long coherence times. And this actually limited the number of atoms that we could have in the experiment um, uh, in such a way that the stability, the precision that we can get as a function of time, which depends on both the coherence time and the number of atoms, was 4.7 times 10 to the minus 16 uh, per root tau. And so this, to give you a reference point, is a factor of 10 worse than what, what so far had been reported in lattice clocks at that time. Now, I want to point out as well that there was a beautiful paper in parallel from the Andres group at Caltech, where this was pushed to larger atom number, to about uh, 40 atoms, but uh, the atoms were interrogated at shorter interrogation times. So these works beg the question of how large a system can we scale to while maintaining quantum coherence, which I'd argue is a basic question of quantum science in general. Um, so one of the, the talk that we took in our experiments uh, was to really sort of have a, a, a separation of jobs in the, in, the, um, in the setup in such a way that we used one color of tweezer wavelength for doing um, loading of many traps and doing ground state cooling in these systems. And this 515 nanometer color is nice because it has a, the atom has a high polarizability at this wavelength, which means we can make many deep traps at less expensive optical power. By contrast, 813 nanometers, this transition is what's so-called magic for the clock transition. It means the ground and the excited state are symmetrically trapped, which means the coherence of this transition is preserved for long periods of time. Um, but the polarizability is, is actually much lower and the light sources are worse there, which means that we can't make as many traps at a given depth. So by separating out the two phases of the experiment, we can actually go to much larger atom number. Uh, and so what we do is we have this initial phase of the experiment where we load and cool the atoms in these green potentials. We actually use an additional uh, lattice in these experiments so that we can actually push on this even further. I won't say too much about that. Um, we then losslessly load these atoms into a science potential 813 nanometers at which we do clock interrogation. And then we load them back into the 515 tweezers and, and detect the atoms. And the upshot of this is that we can have 160 atoms. We can do ground state cooling in 3D for uh, uh, all of the atoms. We still have single site imaging and we can maintain the dead time in these experiments. So the first thing that we learned when we started doing this was that in fact, this overall approach allowed us to have exceptionally long lifetimes for the atoms in our traps. That is the, the, the qubits that we're hoping to use as clocks, uh, uh, they're very long lived. So for instance, the ground state here, which I'm showing you is the black filled in circles, uh, at deep tweezer depths, they can have a lifetime of 160 seconds. At shallower trap depths, they become limited by acoustic noise in our experiment. By contrast, the excited state, it too uh, uh, suffers at shallow depths. And at higher trap depths, it becomes limited by an effect known as Raman scattering. Um, and so what this means is that there's a minimum here uh, where the excited state lifetime is about 47 seconds. Um, and this is actually a record for these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, neutral atom optical clock experiments. Um, so a natural next question to ask is what, um, uh, what is the fundamental coherence time that we can get from these experiments? Uh, uh, intrinsically, we would expect the limit to be 55 seconds based on these ind independent measurements. Um, and so the way we probe this atomic coherence is by doing a, a standard Ramsey experiment where we apply a pi over two pulse, we allow the system to accrue a relative phase, and then we apply a second pi over two pulse to read out this phase as an inversion. Um, Importantly, because we have 160 atoms in this experiment, we can actually get a single snapshot of the relative phase between the atoms and the laser. Uh, sorry, we can, we can, in a single snapshot, we can read out the relative phase between the atoms and the laser. Uh, we don't need to average many times to uh, figure out that quantity, which is important. So when we do these kinds of experiments, what we see is first that the envelope at various different times of the uh, measured triplet P0 fr uh, fraction 
follows this medium gray curve here. So let me first explain what these, these different curves are. So this light gray curve is our measured loss and decay in the system. This medium to gray, gray curve is the sum of the decay that we measure and our expectation for dephasing from the fact that uh, a subtle point that basically the tweezers in our experiment are, are all at a slightly different optical frequency, which then shifts the clock transition frequency by a small amount. And so the atoms atomic coherence at different parts of the array dephase with respect to one another. One another. Finally, the, the darkest gray curve here is the, um, uh, is the independently measured atom laser dephasing. Um, so uh, this might be a little bit confusing to really understand what's happening here. Let's sort of focus in on what's going on. So in the early time scale, if we look at the, I'm expanding those plots that I was just showing you, uh, you see a well-defined fringe in the data, which means that there's a well-defined uh, fate, relative phase between the atomic ensemble and the laser, um, and that the atoms have a well-defined phase with respect to each other. At intermediate times of about 20 seconds, um, the fringe is gone, which means that the atoms of the atomic ensemble has lost its relative phase with respect to the laser, but the atoms themselves still remain coherent with each other. That is to say, they respond in unison to the laser phase uh, even though that relative phase is random with respect to the atoms. Finally, at the, at the latest times, both of these forms of coherence are gone, which is manifest as basically a flat line. Um, so at these intermediate times, what this is really saying is that it's a measure of the atomic coherence, how much quantum coherence can be just, uh, stored in this array. Uh, and it comes about because the blo independent block vectors of all of the atoms are actually correlated. And we can actually read out these correlations using something known as correlation spectroscopy. Um, and what one finds is that uh, at short times, the atoms are very, very correlated, as you'd expect. Um, and at late times, at about 25 seconds, where this dephasing starts to occur, what we can see is that along the diagonals of our array, um, so, sorry, I should say this is a plot of the displacement vector between any pair of atoms uh, in the array, um, uh, and it's this correlation function, which is just how likely they are, it is for the atoms to point in the same direction or different directions. Uh, what one finds is that along the diagonals of the array, the atoms uh, uh, are very correlated, uh, whereas along the anti-diagonals, where there are actually larger frequency differences, the atoms become anti-correlated. And this qualitatively agrees with what we'd expect from an independent theory calculation. Okay, so the upshot of, of these measurements is that we can back out that the ensemble coherence is about 20 seconds. So this is a record for these kinds of systems. And furthermore, that the single particle coherence can extend for up to 50 seconds. Um, corresponding to a quality factor of 6.5 times 10 to the 16. That is, these atoms can oscillate 6 times 10 to the 16 times in a meaningful way with respect to their atomic coherence. Um, by using uh, uh, this coherence, we can then back out, um, we can then rather uh, um, uh, perform relative frequency comparisons to look at the stability of this system. And we find that this is 5.2 times 10 to the minus 17 with an absolute precision of 4.2 times 10 to the minus 19. So what that means is for the transition that we have here, that corresponds to 180 microhertz of precision. Um, just for a comparison point, even though we're working with 160 atoms in the system, this is comparable to the state of the art with optical lattice clocks working with many more atoms because we can operate with so much longer, so much longer interrogation times. Uh, so this really points to this idea that this compromise uh, afforded by the tweezer clocks can be quite powerful. So the next steps for these system uh, uh, include doing accuracy studies, which is key for really understanding how good a clock this can be. Uh, and furthermore, we've started thinking about how we might work in tandem with the E-Lab to provide fast laser feedback that's not limited by thickness. Okay, so this is a, uh, a quantum metrology talk in the time that I have left here. Um, I wanna try to make a connection between uh, the topics that Antoine was describing uh, and this tweezer clock direction. Uh, and I think people can probably anticipate where this is going. Uh, I've just told you about how you can use these tweezer, these tweezer systems to make a long lived stable clock. Uh, we just heard from Antoine how Rydberg interactions can be used to engineer uh, uh, entanglement in these systems. So naturally we'd like to understand whether we can make long lived, well controlled entangled clocks. Um, so, um, uh, to un it's important first to understand why this is a compelling direction. Why would one, one want to combine entanglement with a clock? So um, to explain this, imagine that we're doing a Ramsey sequence, which we're using to stabilize a laser. 
the stability uh, uh, of that system is, is governed by this equation here, which depends on the frequency of the transition, the number of atoms, the amount of time that I interrogate during my Ramsey sequence, and sort of how long I'm doing this for overall. Now, if I had a coherent state, uh, uh, um, this would give me a particular stability. But if I had a cat state, well, then the phase that evolves as a function of time is actually n times faster because this state has n times higher energy than the coherent state. Um, this is great because it means that you can have increased phase sensitivity at a given interrogation time. The problem is that if my atoms have a particular coherence time at a single atom level, while the coherent state might have a coherence time of tco, the entangled state might have an, will, will have a uh, coherence time of tco over n. That is, it's reduced by a factor of n in coherence time. So this means that this gain in phase that you just had from the entangled state is offset by the fact that you can't interrogate for as long. Um, so uh, this TC here, the interrogation time, it will be determined by either how long my atoms remain, uh, uh, remain coherent, or it can be limited by my laser coherence time. That is, if my laser itself dephases, then I can't meaningfully interrogate my atoms. So if my atomic coherence time is what's limiting, that means that this TC here would have to be reduced by an amount of one over N. Whereas the laser, if my laser is limiting, well, then I can just keep it as is and there's a real gain to be had. So that means that if I'm in a regime where my local oscillator, my laser is a limit on my coherence time, then there is something to be gained by engineering entangled states for my clock interrogations. And so this is a real example of where quantum mechanics can help us in a metrology problem. All right, so the way that we'd like to do this in our systems is by using something known as Rydberg dressing. It's a little bit different from what Antoine was talking about in the sense that this Rydberg drive that we'll put on doesn't entirely populate the Rydberg state. It does so virtually in a way that the excited state of the clock transition perturbatively inherits a little bit of Rydberg character. And correspondingly, this creates a spin model known as an Ising spin model um, with kilohertz scale interactions over micron distances. And importantly, these Ising interactions create a squeezing Hamiltonian. That is, it takes something that looks like a coherent state on the block sphere and can squeeze one quadrature so that you have improved sensitivity along that axis. Um, so um, one of the ideas that we're pursuing is really trying to use uh, quantum information concepts to uh, optimize the amount, of uh, the amount of squeezing that we can get in these systems by doing sequential applications of this uh, Ising Hamiltonian and then doing clock rotations. I'm, I'm you know, going a little bit fast here, but I, uh, I'm running out of time, uh, but I think I can do it. So um, the experiment needs here for doing, uh, implementing this kind of protocol include having high fidelity clock control and further implementing coherent Rydberg excitation. So we've been working on both of these problems um, and these are all very recent results, I should say. Um, and so one of the things that we've been doing is uh, uh, um, overlapping an optical lattice with our tweezer array. Uh, and what this does is it improves the confinement of the atoms in the tweezer array uh, such that they're no longer limited by uh, thermal effects in these systems. Um, and importantly, this is enabled by being able to do ground state cooling within this lattice. So we load the tweezers into the lattice, so, uh, into the lattice, yeah, and then do ground state cooling. Um, when we do this, we can have high fidelity clock rotations above 99% improving substantially on our previous work. And furthermore, other upgrades in our experiment allowed us to push the time scale for these rotations from actually about a hertz up to about a kilohertz now. Um, and I should say, add here, these are corrected for uh, detection and preparation errors, but these are actually right now only limited by our imaging. We can load between the, the tweezers and the lattice in a really lossless way. Um, uh, importantly, this lattice also allows us to do high fidelity imaging of the atoms in that potential. Uh, and we so far can do this now at better than 99% fidelity with less than 2% loss. Um, so this really then would remove this 5% error that I was talking about earlier. Also, this points to another direction that Emmanuel alluded to, which is that if you could combine tweezers with lattice systems to really engineer programmable Hubbard systems, that's a completely different direction, but it's one which is also enabled by this kind of technology. Um, so finally, just to conclude here, we've been working on developing Rydberg spectroscopy in our experiment. This is a very bespoke laser system that we've worked on in collaboration with the NIST ion storage group down the road from us so that we can have really high power ultraviolet light to make really large Rabi frequencies homogeneously in our sample. Um, 
And so far, we've demonstrated um, uh, uh, Rabi oscillations with minimal dephasing. Um, the, uh, 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 the contrast of these oscillations are actually limited by things that we all understand, including decay into to states that we detect, um, uh, the way that we were, we were doing this in somewhat dirty fashion. And I, I want to highlight that uh, this work is actually, that this kind of technique for Rabi oscillate, Rabi oscillations has demonstrated fidelities upwards of 90%, 99%. So uh, uh, this is a, a well-established toolbox for the tweezer systems. All right, so with that, I'll conclude. Um, uh, I hope I've convinced you that the alkaline earth systems in tweezers uh, are a really exciting direction in quantum enhanced metrology, but also for things like quantum many body physics and quantum information. Uh, and I wanted to highlight as well that uh, I had this second experiment uh, in my group where we're now trapping ytterbium atoms um, in uh, cold gases. You can see here uh, our green mot uh, in between our electrodes in our uh, high vacuum chamber. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much, Adam.